Hello again everybody, thanks for joining me. I am once again working my way through Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, one chapter at a time. And today we've come to chapter 4, The Corroborating Evidence, subtitled, Is There Credible Evidence for Jesus Outside His Biographies? So let's dive right in. As with the other chapters, uh, Strobel begins chapter four with an anecdote from his own life, uh, his own career as, as a reporter. He used to be a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And this time he tells us about the trial of Harry Aylman. And Harry Aylman was an infamous hitman for the mob in Chicago in the 1970s. And he was arrested and charged, he was suspected of multiple murders, but he was arrested and charged with his one particular crime uh, it was a uh, the murder of a Teamsters Union shop steward, and he was charged with this crime. And they found the prosecution found a witness willing to testify against Aylman, which was a very rare thing. And this witness's name was Louis Almeida, and uh, but he he only agreed to testify in exchange for leniency from uh, the prosecution for his own crimes. He had been an associate of uh, Harry Aylman, so in order to strengthen their case seeing as how their only testimony was from a witness who had uh, a personal selfish motivation for testifying, the prosecution set out to find corroboration for Louis Almeida's testimony to strengthen their case against Harry Aylman. And at this point in the story, Strobel takes a break and spends two whole paragraphs defining and explaining what corroborating evidence is. And again, I have the unpleasant feeling of being condescended to. Uh, how dumb exactly does Strobel imagine his audience to be? To not even know <laughs> what corroborating evidence is? You titled the chapter that, dude! The next section after the, the first part of the Harry Elman anecdote is called The Power of Corroboration. Now that we know what corroboration means, he can tell us about the power of corroboration. So the prosecutors in the Elman case found another witness named Bobby Lowe, who uh, was not a criminal himself, had no reason to seek any favors from the court, and he agreed to corroborate Almeida's testimony about the murder of this Teamsters Union shop steward. Um, but despite their testimony, Aylman was found not guilty by a bribed judge. But once the bribe had been uncovered by the FBI, the prosecutors were able to bring the same case against Aylman again many, many years later. And this time, they won a conviction and Aylman was sentenced to a prison term of from 100 to 300 years. The point being, corroboration is important. And uh, Strobel asks, what evidence is there from outside the Gospels? to support their claims about Jesus. Now we come to his interview with this chapter's expert. And this chapter's expert is Edwin Yamauchi. And uh, Strobel describes entering the building where Yamauchi's office is housed at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And he passes under an arch that is inscribed with the phrase, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And Strobel is very careful to note passing under this arch. Symbolism. Symbolism is the mark of the best and the worst writing, wouldn't you say? So Edwin Yamauchi, our expert for this chapter, he was born in Hawaii to uh, immigrants from Okinawa. He holds a bachelor's degree in Hebrew and Hellenistics and master's and doctorate degrees in Mediterranean studies from Brandeis University. He has been awarded fellowships from the Rutgers Research Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Philosophical Society, and others. He has studied 22 languages, including Arabic, Chinese, Egyptian, Russian, Syriac, Ugaritic, and Comanche. He's delivered papers before many learned bodies. He served as the chairman and the president of the Institute for Biblical Research and also president of the Conference on Faith and History. He knows about some things, apparently. He also participated in the first excavation of the Herodian Temple in Jerusalem, which took place in 1968, which revealed evidence that the temple had been destroyed in the year 70 AD. He's written books, including The Stones in the Scriptures, the scriptures and archaeology, and the world of the first Christians. He was born a Buddhist. He's been a Christian since 1952. And Strobel wonders whether Yamauchi's Christianity will affect his judgment. And he says of Yamauchi, quote, 
In other words, would he scrupulously stick to the facts or be tempted to draw conclusions that went beyond where the evidence warranted? Well, that sort of thing has been known to happen, Lee. Affirming the Gospels. Now, Strobel begins by emphasizing that he doesn't want to suggest that going outside the Gospels for evidence of Jesus is even necessary. So he asks Yamauchi to reaffirm the Gospels as reliable sources for the life of Jesus, just as he's done with the other people that he has interviewed. And uh, Yamauchi says, uh, quote, the Gospels are the most trustworthy, complete, and reliable sources for Jesus, which, as I said in the last video, uh, doesn't really say much about our knowledge of Jesus. It was either the last video or the video before that. These are all starting to run together to me. Strobel asks Yamauchi then how much information there is about Jesus from outside the Gospels, from outside the Bible in general. And Yamauchi mentions immediately Josephus and Tacitus, and he claims that Jesus made more of an impression in history than any other contemporary figure. Uh, that we hear more about Jesus than we hear about Herod the Great or Pontius Pilate. We usually only hear about them in terms of their relation to the Jesus story. And Yamauchi says, quote, Jesus certainly did make an impression on those who believed in him. He did not, of course, among those who did not believe in him. And I found this an odd thing for Yamauchi to say because if his miracles and his resurrection were true events that actually happened, wouldn't Jesus have made a much, much larger impression on a much wider group of people than he actually did? Why would he only have made an impression on his followers? Testimony by a traitor. Yamuchi starts talking about Josephus, and he describes Josephus as an important first century Jewish philosopher. He was born in AD 37 after the life of Christ, I should note. All of these extra Christian sources come from after, and in many cases long after, decades or even centuries after the life of Christ. So, just so we have that out there up front. They don't go out of their way to mention that in this chapter, but the extra biblical sources are all written by people writing much, much, much later even than the Gospels and the other works of the New Testament. So Josephus wrote most of his important works toward the end of the first century. He uh, had surrendered to the Romans during the Jewish-Roman War, and then from that point on became a defender of the Romans, despite the fact that many of his Jewish colleagues had chosen to commit suicide during the war rather than surrender to the Romans. Uh, so for this reason, he was seen as a collaborator, and Josephus was not very well regarded by his fellow Jews. But because he talks about uh, Jesus and James, the brother of Jesus, in some of his writings, he was very popular with Christians. In his book, The Antiquities, Josephus describes how uh, the Jewish high priest Ananias called a meeting of the Sanhedrin and had James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, uh, stoned to death. And Yamauchi trumpets this passage, uh, which he says has never been successfully disputed by any scholar, as a very important reference to the brother of Jesus and a corroboration of the fact that some people believed Jesus to be the Christ, which means the Anointed One or the Messiah. There lived Jesus, the next section. Yamauchi comes to the reference to Jesus in Josephus that is popularly known uh, as the Testimonium Flavianum. And this is a, a quote from the Antiquities that is a, considered a very important reference to Jesus. I think the most important reference to, in, to Jesus in Josephus. Strobel asks whether or not the Testimonium Flavianum is authentic or if it's been doctored by others uh, to craft a more uh, positive, favorable view of Jesus. And Yamauchi says that the passage is fascinating but controversial. And here is the passage, as quoted uh, by Strobel in The Case for Christ. It's, it's a, a truncated version, but this is the version that they're dealing with that is presented in the book. Quote, About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who wrought surprising feats, and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, 
Those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day he appeared to them, restored to life, for the prophets of God had prophesied these and countless other marvelous things about him. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still, to this day, not disappeared. And that, again, is the Testimonium Flavianum, taken from Josephus's The Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, Chapter 3, uh, Part 3, or Verse 3. That's more information, by the way. That's more of a citation than Strobel gives you in the book. That's where, I, if you want to read it, that's where you can actually find it, in Josephus. Yamauchi describes uh, the current scholarly consensus about this passage, and he says that uh, the passage as a whole is authentic, although there may be some interpolations. In other words, writers other than Josephus inserted words into the original text. For example, Yamauchi cites the phrase in the passage I just read, if indeed one ought to call him a man, as a probable interpolation. Josephus was much more uh, a sober writer than that. It doesn't really fit with the, the tone of the rest of the passage. He probably wouldn't have said, if indeed one ought to call him a man. He would not have been that credulous. Um, there are, and there are two other possible interpolations in the text, according to Yamauchi, and those are the phrase, he was the Christ, and the phrase, on the third day he appeared to them restored to life. Josephus probably would not have referred flatly, directly to Jesus as being the Christ. He would have said something like, uh, people believed him to be the Christ, and he would not have stated as a fact that he appeared to people resurrected on the third day. So Yamauchi affirms the reliability of the passage minus those three interpolations, and he claims that it's an important corroboration of Jesus as a martyred religious leader and a wise teacher with a lasting following that endured despite his crucifixion, which was considered to be a humiliating form of death. But let's think about that passage without those three interpolations, because if you take away uh, if indeed one ought to call him a man, he was the Christ, and on the third day he appeared to them restored to life, what you're left with is a passage that only corroborates the existence of Jesus and the existence of the following that, that surrounded him and, and came after him. It does nothing to corroborate the most incredible claims found in the Gospels, the miracles, the, the resurrection. It, it is not a corroboration of any of that. It corroborates the parts about the Jesus story that are the easiest to believe. But one thing that it does establish very nicely is the willingness of early Christians to falsify documents in order to promote their version of the Jesus story. And that doesn't really say much for their reliability as sources, does it? Not only have they Dr. Josephus, as Yamauchi admits here, but in previous videos we've also seen uh, how they inserted phrases into the Gospels for their own purposes. In this context, interpolations means lies. The early Christians inserted phrases into the works of Josephus to make it appear like Josephus had written something that he had, in fact, not written. Therefore, those phrases inserted into Josephus by others, as though they were Josephus' own words, are lies. And the early Christians who put them in there are liars. The importance of Josephus is the next section. Uh, Lee Strobel wonders why Josephus doesn't mention Jesus more often than he does if Jesus was such an important figure. And Yamauchi's answer to this is, well, Josephus was more interested in politics and in the struggle of the Jews against the Romans, and Jesus just wasn't very important to that struggle. So someone like John the Baptist, who Josephus uh, mentions more often in his work, more prominently than Jesus would have been more important to him than Jesus would have been. So that's why Josephus only mentions Jesus a few times. Then Strobel tosses Yamauchi a nice big fat pitch, just like he's tossed to uh, Bruce Metzger and Craig Blomberg. A and he asks him whether or not Jesus was a zealot, or at least sympathetic to the zealots, the anti-Roman movement in the, the Jewish community. And Yamauchi handles this very easily, just as Strobel had intended him to. And he says that Jesus was not a major political opponent of Rome. Jesus even told his followers to pay their Roman taxes. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Um, and he and his followers posed no immediate political threat to Roman rule. So again, Josephus wouldn't have been as interested in Jesus. But nevertheless, despite the fact that the references to the miracles and the resurrection of Jesus are fabrications, and the fact that Josephus himself wasn't even that interested in Jesus, Yamauchi caused the references to Jesus by Josephus 
highly significant. Now we move on from Josephus to the other big extra-biblical source for Jesus, which is uh, the works of Tacitus. And this section is called A Most Mischievous Superstition. Yamauchi describes the reference in Tacitus to Jesus as, quote, the most important reference to Jesus outside the New Testament. So what does Tacitus say about Jesus? Well, here is that reference as quoted by Strobel in The Case for Christ. Quote, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city, as of hatred against mankind. And that comes from Tacitus's work, The Annals, Book 15, Chapter 44, talking about uh, the Christians being blamed for the burning of Rome. Yamauchi claims that that passage from Tacitus establishes that crucifixion was, quote, the most abhorrent fate that anyone could undergo, and the fact that there was a movement based on a crucified man has to be explained. And he says, quote, How can you explain the spread of a religion based on the worship of a man who had suffered the most ignominious death possible? Of course, the Christian answer is that he was resurrected. Others have to come up with some alternative theory if they don't believe that, but none of the alternative views, to my mind, are very persuasive. Note, if you will, how Yamauchi shifts the burden of proof there onto the people who don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Very interesting. If Yamauchi wants an alternative theory to explain Christianity if the resurrection did not actually happen, how about this? People believed that Jesus had been resurrected and that he was coming back. You know, followers of religious movements are not always as easily dissuaded as Yamauchi seems to want us to think. Harold Camping still has followers, despite the fact that he's wrongly predicted the end of the world multiple times. And a televangelist, Benny Hinn, for instance, who has been shown to be a fraud on multiple occasions, still gets enough donations from people that he can live a very comfortable lifestyle on those donations. What is the explanation for this? Yamauchi says that it's significant that Tacitus reports, quote, an immense multitude were willing to die for their belief in Jesus. Now we move on to the next section, which is titled, Chanting as if to a God. And here we deal with another extra-biblical source for Jesus, Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger was the governor of a Roman province called Bithynia, which was a province of Turkey, actually, in the early 2nd century. And uh, what we have of his writing is his collected correspondence, books of his letters, some of which that he sent to the emperor at the time, Emperor Trajan. Those letters are called the Epistulae. And uh, his letters to Emperor Trajan contain references to the early Christians. Yamauchi reads one of those, which was probably written in the year 111, and it says, quote, I have asked them if they are Christians, and if they admit it, I repeat the question a second and a third time, with a warning of the punishment awaiting them. If they persist, I order them to be led away for execution. For whatever the nature of their admission, I am convinced that their stubbornness and unshakable obstinacy ought not to go unpunished. They also declared that the sum total of their guilt or error amounted to no more than this. They had met regularly before dawn on a fixed day to chant verses alternately amongst themselves in honor of Christ as if to a god, and also to bind themselves by oath, not for any criminal purpose, but to abstain from theft, robbery, and adultery. This made me decide it was all the more necessary to extract the truth by torture from two slave women whom they called deaconesses. I found nothing but a degenerate sort of cult carried to extravagant lengths. Now, according to Yamauchi, this reference from Pliny the Younger, like the other references we've been talking about, is very important because it attests to the rapid spread of Christianity. It establishes that 
Jesus was worshipped as a god at this relatively early stage in the development of the faith, and that Christians, quote, maintained high ethical standards and held strongly to their beliefs. And I'll leave it to you guys to judge whether abstaining from theft, robbery, and adultery constitutes high ethical standards. Or would that just be ethical standards? The day the earth went dark. I really like this section. Here Strobel brings up the so-called crucifixion darkness or the crucifixion eclipse. Uh, three of the Gospels, the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, claim that the sky went dark for three hours from about noon till about three o'clock in the afternoon on the day of the crucifixion. And Strobel and Yamauchi discuss a quotation of Thallus by Julius Africanus in AD 221. Thallus apparently attributed the crucifixion darkness to an eclipse, but Africanus argues that it couldn't have been an eclipse. And then Yamauchi reads a quote from uh, Paul Meyer's book, Pontius Pilate, that cites references from Tertullian and Fliegen, both of whom were writing over a century after the fact, that mentioned that an eclipse of the sun was seen throughout the region. And Yamauchi's conclusion is this, quote, So there is non-biblical attestation of the darkness that occurred at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Apparently, some found the need to try to give it a natural explanation by saying it was an eclipse. Now, references that we find in writers like uh, Tertullian and Fliegen to an eclipse that was visible in the Middle East around the year AD 33 makes sense because there was a total solar eclipse in AD 33 that was visible from the Middle East. We have very, very precise models of solar and lunar orbits that allow us to not only predict when an eclipse will happen in the future with great precision, but also to make uh, retrodictions into the past with great precision. So we can know more or less precisely when the sun was eclipsed from what part of the world uh, in the past. It's really cool. So we know that there was an eclipse that was visible from the Middle East in the year AD 33. But unlike the darkness that is described in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which lasted three hours, the eclipse in the year AD 33 lasted four minutes, and a maximum of four minutes. In many places it would have been less than that. It depends on where you're standing on the planet viewing the eclipse as to what the duration is. Um, so we have an actual event, an eclipse in the year AD 33, that lasted four minutes that is depicted in the Gospels as lasting three hours, which is 24 times the length of the longest possible solar eclipse. That sounds like some of that legendary invention that the Gospels were supposedly written too early to contain to me. Moving on to the next section, very briefly, it's a portrait of Pilate. Yamauchi uh, tries to reconcile the, quote, obstinate and inflexible version of Pilate that other historical accounts refer to with the, the weaker figure that we find in the Gospels by pointing out that Sejanus, who was Pilate's patron, had fallen from power two years prior to the estimated date of the crucifixion, which left Pilate in a very vulnerable position in his office, and so he would have wanted to appease his Jewish subjects. So when the, the Jewish priest showed up and said, hey, we want you to crucify this guy, Pilate would have been more likely in his weakened state uh, to just go along with it. Other Jewish accounts is the next section, and here Strobel and Yamauchi discuss the Talmudic references to Jesus. Yamauchi mentions that uh, the Talmud describes Jesus as a false messiah who practiced magic and was put to a just death for his blasphemy. And they speculate that Jesus was actually the child of a Roman soldier and Mary, which Yamauchi takes as a confirmation that there was something unusual about the birth of Jesus, which is a just a shocking example of confirmation bias. I mean, Christians believe that Jesus was the product of God and Mary. And the Talmud says, you know, he was probably, it's probably just a rumor, but so what? The Talmud says he was probably the product of a Roman soldier and Mary. And Yamauchi says, see corroboration. They both agree 
that there was something unusual about his birth. <laughs> Evidence apart from the Bible is the next section. Strobel asks Yamauchi, why aren't there even more references to Jesus outside of the New Testament than the ones we find? And first, y Yamauchi kind of talks out of both sides of his mouth here. First, he hedges his bet by saying that, well, often when religious movements begin, they won't really gather much attention and people won't record things about them until many generations after they were started, if they survived that long. But then he also claims that the references that we do find to Jesus are actually so much better than the references we find to other ancient religious figures. For instance, he mentions the long intervals between the lifetimes and the recording of the scriptures or the biographies of Zoroaster and Buddha and Muhammad compared to the relatively short interval between the life of Jesus and the writing of the New Testament. But remember the earlier chapters we talked about? Didn't Craig Blomberg say that we should be able to trust oral traditions? Does it really matter what the interval was between the life of Zoroaster and the writing of the, the Gathas of Zoroaster? Strobel then asks, uh, what information could we glean about Jesus if we completely ignored the New Testament? We just pretend we didn't have any of that and we're going solely on the non-biblical sources. What could we, what kind of a picture could we paint of Jesus just based on those? So Yamauchi says if we rely only on what we find in Josephus and Tacitus and Pliny the Younger and the Talmud and other sources like that, we would know that Jesus was a Jewish teacher that people believed he performed miracles and healed the sick, that people believed he was the Messiah, that he was rejected by Jewish leaders, that he was crucified under the authority of Pontius Pilate, that his followers remained faithful after his ignominious death and believed he was still alive, and that people from all different walks of life worshipped him as God. In other words, see, they, 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 mention, they mention all these facts we would know about Jesus, though this is really important, but really we would only know the most general facts about Jesus himself and a few more equally general details about the people in the cult that grew up around Jesus that eventually evolved into the Christian church. I mean, I can't see how any of these details... I mean, if, if, you're, if your thesis is that there never was a historical Jesus, and a lot of people make that argument, and I actually think it's a compelling argument, even though it's not really my view, it might be somewhat persuasive against that argument, but even if you convince people that there was a historical Jesus, that he was a Jewish teacher, that he did have followers who believed he was the Messiah, etc., etc., you still have a long way to go before you can convince people that they ought to be one of those followers. We move on to the next section corroborating early details. Strobel prompts Yamauchi to talk about uh, the Pauline epistles which he also presents as important evidence for Jesus from outside the Gospels, even though they are part of the New Testament, they're outside the Gospels, so he counts those as extra sources. They mention that uh, Paul's writing is the earliest that we have in the New Testament, that predates the Gospels, and they talk about Paul's focus on the resurrection of Jesus and the atonement of Jesus, and how he Paul doesn't really make references to Jesus's parables or Jesus's miracles. And to Yamauchi this indicates that the that atonement and resurrection element of Jesus's ministry were of the greatest importance to Paul. But couldn't that also indicate that Paul just was simply unaware of the stories of the parables or the miracles because he was writing so early that those elements had not yet entered the narrative? Yamauchi then talks of Paul's corroboration of Jesus's humility and Jesus's obedience and his love for sinners and his deity because Paul calls Jesus the Son of God and the image of God. They also both make a big deal out of Paul's worship of Jesus because Paul had a Jewish background therefore it's very significant that he would have converted to Christianity from a Jewish background. Truly raised from the dead is the next section. Yamauchi mentions the letters of the Apostolic Fathers, the early church leaders, who were writing just after the New Testament would have been written, so relatively, still relatively early documents. And he talks about these letters of the Apostolic Fathers affirming many basic facts about Jesus. For instance, the teachings of Jesus, 
the crucifixion, the resurrection, sort of just the, the basic, the Cliff Notes version of the Jesus story. Yamauchi singles out among these apostolic fathers uh, Ignatius, who was the Bishop of Antioch, who was fed to the lions by the Romans in the year 117. Ignatius emphasized both the deity and the humanity of Jesus. In other words, he came out against uh, docetism, which we talked about last time. And he wrote in one of his letters that survives that Jesus had been truly persecuted, truly crucified, truly raised from the dead, and that those who believed in him would also be truly raised from the dead themselves. My question is, why should I care about anything that Ignatius says. Everything he says is hearsay. He's writing long after the event supposedly took place. He's not an eyewitness. He's not basing anything he says on eyewitnesses because we've already established that most of the Gospels cannot be counted as eyewitness testimony. So, and, and also, the early church leaders, the Apostolic Fathers, are these the same people who falsified Josephus and added verses to the Gospels to suit their own purposes? Why are they good sources? Now we have another example at, toward the end of this section of Strobel's tough objective journalism. He says, quote, Put all this together, Josephus, the Roman historians and officials, the Jewish writings, the letters of Paul and the Apostolic Fathers, and you've got persuasive evidence that corroborates all the essentials found in the biographies of Jesus. Even if you were to throw away every last copy of the Gospels, you'd still have a picture of Jesus that's extremely compelling. In fact, it's a portrait of the unique Son of God. And at this point, I'm wondering, do we really need to continue this? I mean, look, this is, this is chapter 4, all right? We're right here. We're this far into the book, okay? We're not even halfway through the book. Do we really need to keep going? Because it sounds like Strobel has already made his mind up. He sounds pretty convinced. Now, as with the other experts he's spoken to, Strobel asks Yamauchi, what his research has meant for his personal faith. And Yamauchi says that his studies have greatly strengthened his faith in Christianity and enriched his spiritual life. And Yamauchi says, quote, This doesn't mean that I don't recognize that there are some issues that still remain, but those issues don't even begin to undermine my faith in the essential trustworthiness of the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament. Dr. Yamuchi, the fact that you can recognize that there are still some issues with the authenticity of the New Testament, yet those issues don't even begin to undermine your faith, testifies to how worthless the knowledge you claim to have gained from your faith actually is. And finally, last section, what else? Truth that sets us free. Strobel reiterates once again how convincing he has found uh, the corroborating evidence we've been discussing in this chapter for Jesus, his favorite manipulation technique. Oh, I found it very convincing, said the author. And then he references the book, The Verdict of History, by Gary Habermas, who he interviews later in the book. We'll get to that in a few weeks. Um, and in the book, Habermas cites seven secular sources, ooh, seven, in making the case for the authenticity of the Gospels and the divinity of Jesus. Strobel describes Habermas's conclusion uh, that the sources claiming the divinity of Jesus ought to be trusted, quote, a stunning corroboration for the most important assertion by the most influential individual who has ever lived. Now there's Strobel once again showing his complete lack of bias. And finally Strobel ends the chapter just as he began it by passing back under that arch outside Yamauchi's office building that reads, ye shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he did that because those words are appropriate to this chapter and to this book as a whole in ways that Strobel doesn't seem to realize. By studying the Bible and by studying the unimpressive arguments that men like Strobel make in defense of it, you can come to know the truth. And the truth is that the Bible is a book, just like any other book. It holds no divine truth, it holds no superior morality, you're not bound to follow its commandments or believe in any of its claims. And I and a lot of other former Christians can tell you that that is a very, very freeing truth. That's it for this week. Next time, I'll be back with Chapter 5, The Scientific Evidence. That sounds exciting. Subtitled, Does Archaeology 
confirm or contradict Jesus' biographies. That's it for this one. Thank you guys again for watching and for paying attention and for responding. The comments are wonderful. I'm glad that a few people have gotten some use out of these videos. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Like I said last week, it's exhausting and frustrating, but it's also a lot of fun and really uh, useful to me, too, to, to construct arguments against this stuff and to, to just to hear the opposing position, even though, uh, to be fair, the, the, the opposing position is not very well represented by Lee Strobel here. Um, but it is a very popular book, and it's a book that atheists are sort of forced to encounter very often. So uh, those of you who are watching and enjoying this and taking something out of it, I really appreciate it. And thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.